Hey folks, Todd Colburn here, Aerospace Structures Series. This lecture is on classical lamination theory. This is the meat and potatoes for analyzing a composite laminate. This lecture is appropriate for arrows, mechanicals, civils, or any industry professional evaluating composites. The method we're going to present is going to be simple and direct. Let's take a look at how it works. Let's start by reminding ourselves of our nomenclature. This is our nomenclature for the lamina, where we have an X and a Y, and following right-hand rule, we're defining Z as downward. So our positive Z is acting downward. Our forces and moments are defined also using right-hand rule, where positive is a force in a positive direction on a positive face. That would be a positive running load. If it's negative on a negative face, that's also positive. If it's on a positive face but in a negative direction, that's going to be negative, and so on. And our moments are defined the same manner, just like this. We have to keep that in mind. Next, we need to see what our laminate nomenclature is. Now remember, I uh, encourage you, whenever you're doing a composite analysis of a laminate, start by sketching your lamina and identifying each and every layer. We're going to number these layers from top to bottom. So the uppermost layer is laminate 1. We're going to use k equals 1. The next one will be k equals 2. Down to the bottom, which will be the max number of layers, will be the last and bottommost layer. Next, we're going to define a couple parameters for position. Z is going to be the position of the bottom of each layer. So Z1 is the bottom of the first layer. Z2 is the bottom of the second layer. That means Z0 is the top of the first layer because it's the bottom of the no layer. Okay? So that's our Z parameter. We've got our Z bar parameter, which is going to be the distance to the midplane of each lamina. Midplane of each lamina. So Z1 is the, the position of the midplane of the uppermost lamina. Zn is the position of the midplane of the lowermost lamina, and so on. Remember, we're identifying positive Z as positive downward, acting from the midplane. Now, our coordinate system was defined from the top, aiming down, but actually, to get more precise, we're going to number all of these from the midplane of the element, as if that lamina is bending about the midplane, which isn't always true, but that's what we're going to pretend. That means any layer that is above the midplane of the total laminate will have a negative Z and a negative Z bar. And any layer that is below the midplane will have a positive Z and a positive Z bar. We can calculate the total laminate thickness by just summing all of the layer thicknesses. These little three equations we're going to find are quite useful. T is just the summation of the T's of each lamina. Z is, we could start by saying, okay, it's minus T over 2, where T is the total laminate now you'll notice there's a little difference in nomenclature because I'm calling in this picture, I'm calling T lam the total laminate thickness, but down here in this middlemost equation, I'm calling that just T. So if you take the total laminate thickness divided by 2, and we're taking the negative of that, that starts at the top, right? That gives us to the negative, the top of that, which is negative T over 2. And then you add, so layer 1... T, uh, Z1 is at the bottom of the first layer. That means we're going to add that first layer's thickness to that value and so on. This is a nice little simple way to program this. Our Z bar then is going to be the Z of each layer minus half of the layer's thickness. Since Z is located at the bottom of each layer and Z bar is located at the midplane of each layer, which is just a little bit negative, a little bit above that. These three parameters we're going to use throughout. Got it? So this is our picture. We should have that on our page and have it handy as we're going through the analysis. 
All right, now let's think back to an isotropic rod under axial load. We've developed a number of equations for these in our earlier studies. We know that the stress is just P over A. We know the deflection is just PL over AE. We know that the strain is just the deflection over the original length. And we know that we could also write that as P over AE by just combining these equations. Now don't forget this. Let's take another step forward. Remember also, if we have an isotropic beam under pure bending, we also developed relations like the stress was M, we called it MC over I, but now we have this new nomenclature where Z is from the midplane acting down, uh, as we see here, for a positive bending moment, which puts our beam in smiley face bending. Z is from the midplane. Now this is shown as the neutral axis for like an isotropic beam. In, the, in our classical lamination theory, we're going to be assuming that's the midplane. But here it's the neutral axis. So Z is acting downward. That means MZ over I. If Z is positive, we're going to get a positive stress. If Z is negative, we're going to get a negative stress. We also saw Hooke's Law. And uh, we saw the relation for strain then. We saw that we could relate strain to curvature. We studied this back in our Structures 1 class where we just found that the Z position from the neutral axis divided by the radius of curvature is another way to express the strain. We introduced our curvature, which is 1 over R. So R is the radius of curvature, and, uh, and kappa is the curvature, which is 1 over that radius of curvature. And we found, the, combining these, that we can write the strain as the position, the distance from the neutral axis, z, times our curvature is actually another way of writing the strain. These are some key equations that we saw and developed when we were studying structures 1, bending of isotropic members. We also had our Hooke's Law, stress equals EE. We saw that we could rearrange that to write the strain this way, which means that we can write the strain as mz over ei. And since our curvature was defined as we showed it, we could say that the curvature is just m over ei. This is an important relation. Now, if we have an isotropic beam subjected to both axial load and pure bending, then we could express the strain by combining these two the strain for an axial load, the strain for pure bending, we find that if we have the strain of the midplane plus the z position of any layer from the neutral axis times our curvature. That is a way to write the strain at any point. And we're going to use the subscripts k, which could represent any point in that isotropic beam. We're next going to relate that to a classical lamination kind of theory part. So if we have a laminate beam under axial load and pure bending, it deflects like this. Once again, Z is now from not the neutral axis, but the midplane, as if that were the neutral axis. We've got positive bending, and we again have the radius of curvature, which actually more accurately would be drawn to the center of curvature, not to the inside uh, radius. And we can write the strain. We now have three equations for strain. One for strain in the x direction, one for strain in the y direction, one for the shear strain. And all of these are going to be written in the same form as we saw for isotropic materials, where we've got the strain in the x. We can uh, write these as a vector to put them all together. The strain in the x, y, and the shear strain are just the midplane strains. Epsilon x0, epsilon y0, and epsilon and the shear strain 0, plus the z position from the midplane to any point times the curvature x, y, and x, y. Now these are both, both the strains, the extensional strains and shear strains, and the curvatures are all the values at the midplane of the laminate, okay, those values. So we can take those, if we knew what those laminate strains were at the midplane in curvatures, we could then compute the strains on any point of the laminate. This is one key equation that we're going to need to use.
Okay, so we're talking about bending a laminate beam. Our Kirchhoff assumptions, the assumptions that we're going to apply, is going to be, we're going to assume that all lamina in the laminate are perfectly bonded, which means there's no slip at all. The bonds are infinitesimally thin and non-deformable, non-shear deformable, so there's no slippage at all. A line straight and perpendicular to the middle surface remains this way, and the normals have constant length so that the strains perpendicular to the middle surface are also ignored, the inner laminar tension kind of values. Okay? If we proceed, we can now write our deflection and the resultant strains in the way that we did a moment ago. We could write them like this. This is the center, uh, the mid-plane strains, right? The strain in the x direction is just the change in length over original length. And in the y and the shear strain, we can write it like this. This is very similar to what we've been doing. And here are curvature relations. Now we can take the second derivative of the deflection with respect to x, the second derivative of the deflection with respect to y, and so on, to get our curvatures. So these are our mid-plane strains. These are our mid-plane curvatures. Okay? The total strain at any spot, as we saw in the last slide, can be written this way for plates. Now, if we had a cylindrical element, it's, there's a little more, it's a little more complicated than that. But typically, we'll ignore that and use this approximate relation as if the plates are flat. Okay? All right. So this is our relation to calculate the strain at any point. We could call that point K. Uh, to bring to our mind those layers, but really this is valid at any point. At any point, we can calculate the strain by taking the mid-plane strains and adding the z position of that point times the curvatures, as we see here. Okay? Okay, so remember, we now can say, all right, we saw before how to relate stresses to strains but now we have a bigger relation for the strains than we did before. And so we can do that since we're talking body coordinates here. We've got the strains in the, and curvatures in the xy uh, directions. So we can actually uh, relate our body coordinate strains and curvatures to our body coordinate stresses at any point using this relation. This is at any point in the laminate or in any layer. Now, because these Q bars can be different for each layer, our stress variation may not be linear, and we see some other weird things. This little sketch from Jones kind of shows it, where while we have a linear strain distribution, our stress distribution may be different, and our moduli may be different. Or the reason that our stress distribution is different than our strain, no longer linear, is if our moduli are different for the different layers. All right, so let's take this a step further. Let's remember our nomenclature that we're using, and we need it uh, both for the laminate itself and for the forces and moments. Now, we can actually calculate the running load on the total. Now, if you imagine that we've already calculated the stress in each layer, so we've got the stress in each layer, each and every layer, and each of those has a little width, dz. So a stress times a little element of height, if you multiply that out, that will give you, uh, remember the stress is just n over t, running load divided by thickness. So the stress times the thickness is going to give you the running load. And if we integrate that across the stress, times this little dz across the entire laminate, we would have the total running load on the element in the x direction. We could do the same thing for moments. If we take that stress times dz, that's a force now, or a running load, and multiply it by the z position, that's going to give us the moment that each little elemental strip causes about the midplane, and that if we summed all those up using an integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2, we then get the total moment on the entire laminate. That's what this equation says. All right, so far so good. Here's our sign convention for forces and moments, as we saw before. Now we're ready to start 
drilling that down further. So our running load we can write in matrix notation. We actually that running load that we saw so simply above that means we've got a running load in the x, the y, and shear directions. We're going to sum up the sigma x, sigma y, and the tau xy times the little increment of dz. We're going to do the same thing for a moment. We've got mx, my, and mxy, and we're integrating the stresses. But this time, the stress times dz is actually times the fat thickness is actually the running load multiplied by z, which gives us the moment, as we just saw. Now, because what this means is now, so now we have actually, though, we have a number of layers. Each layer is contributing. So while we're going to integrate across the whole laminate, we also have, and actually, I'm, we're actually going from minus to plus, right, from up here to down here. We also can say, well, wait a minute, we're going to do this integral across each layer. We're going to integrate across the first layer, integrate across the second layer. So actually, for each ply, we're going to integrate from top to bottom, from top to bottom, those equations. We're going to do it for the running load, and we're going to do it for the moment. This means we're integrating across the lamina, then we're going to add that to integrating across the next one, and so on, until we're all the way through the laminate. Now we can write it like this, since we knew, we had we wrote last slide, that that stress is just that Q bar times the strains, that's the Q bar we had. So actually, if we have a bunch of layers, for each layer, we take the Q bar of each layer times the integral of the strains, since the q-bar is not changing, right, we're, we're adding all those up, so we're integrating our strain across each. We've got the mid-plane strains and the mid-plane curvatures, and we have that in both of these equations. Got that so far? So we're going to take the summation of those q-bars. We also have the integration across the strains, both the mid-plane strains and the curvature for each equation. Okay, let's hold that thought go to the next slide. So we have some room. There's our nomenclature again. This is what we just developed for running load and moment. And now we notice, wait a minute, our strains and our curvatures, they're not functions of z, because we're talking about the mid-plane strain and the mid-plane curvatures. Therefore, we can pull those out of the integral. And when we pull those out of the integral, we can write that this way where we pull out our strains, but we have to leave our q-bar, and we have to leave our dz and our zdz terms. When we pull those out, we actually can define a new set of variables, our a and our b and our d elements of the matrix. We can write this in matrix notation, so where this a is going to introduce, it's going to be, so actually if you multiply this out, you see we've got the q-bar, the summation of the q-bars times the integral of the mid-plane strains times dz. That's this first term of the A matrix times the epsilon, the, the mid-plane strains, plus we have that q-bar, the summation of the q-bars against that z dz parameter and the curvatures. And we have that same thing for both the running load and the moment running moment equation. So we can actually write it like this. Now we've defined new variables where the A matrix, we can see, is just the Q bar of each ply times that integral of dz. That integral of dz from top to bottom is just the thickness. And that integral from top to bottom for the curvatures of ZDZ is just the thickness times the position. So actually we can see that these terms of the A, B, and D matrix are related to the Q bar and the integral of DZ and the integral of the ZDZ, where it can be shown that the A terms, A matrix terms, are just the Q bar. So what this, this summation means is we're going to take the Q bar of a matrix, of a lamina, we're going to multiply by the Z 
of that lamina minus z minus 1, which is actually just the thickness. So we can take the q-bar of a single layer, multiply by its thickness, and then the second layer we got the q-bar times its thickness, the third layer we have the q-bar times its thickness, and so on. Sum all those up by collapsing a bunch of transparency slides, sum them all up, and that gives us the A matrix. It's going to be the same size as that Q-bar matrix, but it now has the thickness embedded in those Q-bar terms. Now if we look at the B matrix, we now can show that what that becomes, if we do that integration, is we're going to have the summation of the Q-bars, so once again we have those Q-bar matrices, times the z squared minus z k minus 1 squared terms. And it's one half of all that. Now, you can actually, it can be shown that actually that z bar of the k squared minus z minus 1 squared term, one half of all that, is actually just the t times the z, which actually we saw up above as well, we can kind of see the z dz term, and that actually equates to the t times the z bar. So what this means is we can take the q bar. So before we took the q bar of the first layer multiplied by the thickness, q bar of the second layer times this thickness, and so on, and just add all those together, all those matrices, just like they're stacked up and squished into a sandwich you're going to stuff in your mouth. Now we're doing the same thing for the b matrix with the second term, so what we're going to get is the Q-bar matrix, and we're going to multiply it by the T and the Z-bar of that ply. So we've got the Q-bar for the ply. We multiply by the thickness of that ply. That means all terms get multiplied by the thickness. And the Z position of the midplane, that means all the terms of the Q-bar matrix get multiplied by that. And that becomes our B matrix, which also is the same size as the Q-bar matrix, but now it's become a B matrix because the thickness and the position are embedded. Our third term, which actually is our D matrix term, is from that lower equation, and that is actually going to be the Z. So when we do that integral of Z squared, we're going to get a Z cubed term, a one-third Z cubed term, just like we saw when we took the integral of Z, we got a one-half Z squared term. Now what this is is we're going to have one-third times the summation of the Q-bars times the Z to the thirds minus the Z minus 1 to the thirds. And it can be shown by multiplying that out that that one-third Z cubed minus Z K, uh, K minus 1 cubed term equates to the thickness times the Z-bar squared term plus the T cubed over 12 term. Well, if you look at this, you realize, oh my gosh, this is just a bending parameter. What we have here is our A matrix is just our Q bar times a thickness, which is like an area term. Our B matrix is the Q bar times a TZ, which is like a moment term. And our D matrix is like our resistance to bending, because here we have the TZ squared term, which gives us the resistance of that area, each ply, where it's at and how it contributes to resisting moment plus the 112 bh cube kind of term that t cubed over 12 which is how much it resists bending in and of itself in terms of our calculation what this means is we have this q bar matrix and now we're multiplying we're going to take this for each and every ply we have the thickness times the z bar squared plus the thickness cubed over 12. That quantity, and we're going to take that quantity and smack it up against all nine terms of the Q-bar matrix, and that gives us the D matrix. So we see the A matrix is an extensional matrix. The B matrix is a moment coupling kind of matrix, and the D matrix is a bending resistance kind of matrix. That's what we have here. And this enables us to just take our Q bar, to turn it into an A and a B and a D matrix, and assemble this big Mamba Jamba set of equations. Now, that's getting simpler 
It's not simple enough. So hold this thought, hold these equations, let's take them in the next slide, and think about this a bit more. This is our first set of equations we now have shown that our running load is just our A matrix times the midplane strains plus the B matrix times the curvatures, midplane curvatures. And our moment is just the B matrix times the midplane strains plus the D matrix times the midplane curvatures. Classical lamination theory is going to enable us now to take the midplane strains and curvatures and calculate the running loads. Or, more commonly, to take the running loads and moments on the element and convert that to midplane strains and curvatures. Once we have these, we can calculate the stresses in each and every lamina in body coordinates. We can then transform those into the material coordinate directions of each lamina and then evaluate whether or not the lamina fails. Remember, we're never going to evaluate the laminate for failure. The way we evaluate the laminate is by evaluating the behavior, the, the loading strain behavior of the laminate, using that to convert that to our material principal direction stresses and strains and then evaluating the, each lamina for failure. Okay, so here's our big mamba jamba matrix. Let's take this a bit further. And we can actually put those all together in a single matrix. Here's our composite laminate theory analysis procedure. We're going to use our Modula, our properties of each lamina are E1, E2, Poisson's ratio, and G to get Q for each and every lamina. We're going to transform that Q for the orientation of the lamina to get our Q bar for that lamina. We're going to use the thickness of each ply to determine all the positions of the top and bottom of each layer and the midplane positional parameter Z bar for each layer. We're then going to use our Z Q bar along with our Z position and our thicknesses of each uh, uh, lamina to calculate our A, B, and D matrices by calculating the terms of those matrices. We're going to use our running loads and moments in the A, B, B, D matrix to determine our midplane strains and curvatures for each lamina. And we're going to do that with this form of the equation. You'll notice we now have combined our A, B, B, D matrices into one matrix, which we can call the A, B, B, D matrix. And this is a partition matrix where A has nine terms, B has nine terms, B has nine terms, and D has nine terms, right? So now we have a six by six matrix. So that means we can take the inverse of that matrix, multiply by the running loads and moments, which have three terms each, and calculate the midplane strains and curvatures, which also have three terms each. Okay? We use our midplane strains and curvatures. Once we have the midplane strains and curvatures, we can use those. Now, these are in body coordinates, right? These loads are going to be in body coordinates, so our strains and curvatures are in body coordinates. We can now use those body coordinate midplane strains and curvatures to calculate the strains in each layer. Now, we could do this anywhere. We could do it at the very top of the laminate or at any point in the laminate. But the place we're most often going to do this is right at the center, at the midplane of each and every lamina. That's where we're going to calculate stresses. At the center or midplane of the lamina, of each lamina. So we're going to plug in for layer one. We're going to take the strains at the midplane and the curvatures of the midplane and the Z position of that lamina. In this case, we're going to use the Z bar of that lamina and put in this equation, and that will give us the strains at the midplane of that lamina. Now, if we put in the Z position, top or bottom, that would give us the strains at the top or bottom of the lamina. Like I said, we can do that, and I'll show that in an example in a moment. 
But what we typically will do is calculate the mid-plane strains, which means we're putting in z-bar into this equation. For zk, that's going to be z-bar of the lamina. We put in the z-bar for the first lamina. That gives us the mid-plane strains and body coordinates for that lamina. We're going to use those in a minute, but next we go to the next lamina, put in the z-bar of that, and that gives us the strains at the midplane of the second lamina, and so on for each and every layer. Once we have all of those body coordinate strains, we can convert those to uh, stresses. We can actually convert those to material principle direction strains, or we can go first by using Q-bar to convert those body coordinate strains to body coordinate stresses at the midplane of each lamina. We then can transform those stresses from the body coordinates to the material principle coordinates using our transformation matrix. And now we can evaluate failure using a suitable failure criterion. That's how we do it. That's our basic analysis procedure. Got it? If we look at our, our uh, equations here, uh, we talked about coupling once before, but if we just focus on the terms of this A, B, B, D matrix, we get some more insight into coupling. We can see this A16, A26 terms. What this does is it takes our shear loading and it couples it with our extensional strains. So what this means is for NX, if there is a term, if this term A16 is non-zero, that means that any shear strain that the element experiences will introduce axial load. It also means any uh, axial strain will cause shear loads. So pulling on the thing will result in shear deformation as well as extensional deformations. Rather confusing. Now, if we look at our B matrix, we see the B11, B12, and B22 terms, those four terms up the upper left of that, ma that sub matrix, those are the coupling of bending with axial load. That means an axial load, running load, causes bending of the element, and vice versa. Our B1626 and 66 six couple our axial extension with torsion. That's confusing behavior. And our D16 and D26 terms couple our torsion with bending behavior. So that's a quick look at coupling. So let's see how this actually plays out. How do we go through, let's look at an example and see how to use these equations. So let's say we have a six-ply laminate. Let's say it happens to be 0 0.01 thick layers of unidirectional glass epoxy, zero plus 90, plus minus 45, 90, zero. And let's say we have this running load and moment. We have axial running load, we have transverse running load, and we have a moment on the thing. Looks like there's no shear applied. What are the margins of safety in the ply? Well, we start off by getting our properties of, gla of unidirectional glass epoxy, and we, cal we can calculate actually our Q first or our T first. Let's go ahead and calculate our T first. Our first layer is zero, so it looks like it's the unity matrix. Makes sense, the identity matrix. Our second layer is 90, which is a slight deviation of that. We've got 245, so plus and a minus, got it. And then we have another 90, another, another zero. Okay, we can calculate now using our moduli, our E1, E2, G, and Poisson's ratio, we can calculate the Q for each matrix, and that's going to, for each lamina, excuse me, and that's going to be this. You'll notice all the Qs are the same. Why? Because they're all the same thickness and they're all the same material. Makes sense. Now we multiply those. We transform them with our transformation matrix using the equations for that, and we get our Q-bar matrix, which now looks like this. You'll notice layer 1, and layer 6 are identical, both the Q and Q bar, because those were at the zero directions. And then the others are each adjusted accordingly. Okay, 
we now can calculate, now that we have Q bar, we can calculate our A matrix, our B matrix terms, our C, our D matrix terms, A, B, and D, excuse me. We put those together, and this is now, we create our A, B, B, D matrix, where we have all the terms of the A matrix in that upper quadrant submatrix, all the terms of the B matrix in the two sub matrices there, and our D matrix lower right. So there is our big Mamba Jamba A, B, B, D matrix. We then can apply the equation where we take the inverse of that matrix, multiply it by the running loads and moments, and we get the strains and curvatures at the midplane, which you'll see here. These running loads and moments gave us these strains and curvatures. You can practice this on your own. Make sure you can repeat these numbers. Now, if we calculate the midplane strains now, now this little table here is out of my little MATLAB code, and what this is is giving us the strains at a bunch of spots. You'll notice I have these are in body coordinates. We have x, y, and shear values. You'll notice I have calculated strains at the top of every ply, at the bottom of every ply, and at the midplane of every ply. Now, like I said before, we're typically just going to do this at the midplane. However, every now and then we'll want to check that extreme surface, uppermost surface or lowermost surface, to take a look at how much strain is happening there. Uh, more commonly, we're just going to focus on the midplane, but this gives us the whole enchilada. That middle piece is giving us the midplane strains for body coordinates. We can now, if we continued on and calculated our stresses like we showed, then the next step gives us our stresses, and here's our stresses. And once again, I'm showing the top of each lamina the bottom of each lamina, and the midplane of each lamina for body coordinates. When we transform that, those body coordinate stresses to midplane principle, material principle direction uh, stresses, we get this. And now we see, we see in the one direction, the material one direction, we see what the stresses are in each ply. In the material two direction, the stress in each ply, and the shear stress in each ply. And if we just write a margin of safety by just comparing each of those to their allowable without any coupling of the psi wu or psi hill or anything else, then these would be the margins of safety. We see the minimum margin of safety for this particular loading on this particular lamina is ply 5, where we're seeing a 2% margin of safety in the uh, two material direction is the critical. That's the most critical ply. All the other margins of safety are fairly healthy. The next lowest one is a, what, 4.1 or something in layer six. See that? So that is how to evaluate class lamination theory. This is the meat and potatoes of composite analysis. And uh, you're going to want to spend enough time practicing this to make sure that you have this mastered. Enjoy.